Hey guys, John Paulamy here, Actionable Intelligence. Today is Saturday, December 16th, and this is the weekly market update. Uh, before I get started, a little bit of housekeeping. I'm making the transition over to Substack. You may have seen, if you're a subscriber uh, over there, you might have seen some emails coming or posts that I'm making. Um, so let me just break this down. If you're a current subscriber to the Actionable Intelligence Alert newsletter, uh, and you have uh, been grandfathered in under the $79 founders uh, subscription rate or the 150 uh, rate, You that will carry on. I don't know how to migrate that over to Substack yet, so you'll just continue to get the newsletters via email. Don't worry. If you subscribed at the $179 uh, rate before I went on Substack, when, I, when it comes up for resubscription, I'll be asking you to migrate over there to Substack. Um, for, the free e for the free newsletter that comes out every week that I usually publish to my email list, I'm going to be migrating that list over to Substack, hopefully in the next week or so. Uh, so you should be getting the seeing the weekly emails, free emails that I put out uh, will likely uh, come through uh will likely come through the uh, Substack. So um, I'm learning more and more about the Substack tool. It's really good, actually. I wish I would have done this earlier, but you know, it is what it is. It'll make the resubscriptions easier. You won't have to be messing around with all these emails. I've already seen some people have signed up uh, via Substack. I would ask that if you are contemplating subscribing to the newsletter, that you uh, do it via the Substack link that I will put in the show notes going forward. I also have to, uh, there's a few other things I need to work on. Um, I think I've got it down about how to do the portfolio reporting in Substack, uh, basically with a link. And then the back issues, I'm still working on the best way to do that. So it's a, pro it's a work in progress. Uh, I know it's a little confusing. Uh, I'll probably try to send out an email to everyone and uh, make sure that uh, folks are understanding uh, what's going on. Uh, but if you are a current uh, subscriber, uh, don't worry. Uh, your your rates are grandfathered in, and I just need to figure out if I can get you over on the Substack. It just limits the amount of, or the way I look at it now, the amount of diff different tiers you can have. So um, I'm trying to figure that out and see if I can add more tiers to the pricing for specific uh, uh, email addresses or specific people. So we'll see how that goes. Okay, having said that, let's move into the information for this week. Again, the disclaimer, anything that you hear or see on this podcast or video is not to be taken as investment advice, I'm not a registered financial advisor. I cannot give you individual investment advice. Please do your own due diligence. It's your money. It's your responsibility. Okay, um, so... I wanted to talk about this because this last week was really weird. Um, I'll talk in another slide, uh, point that out even more. Mr. Powell uh, saying earlier in the week that, you know, basically they were done raising rates and that uh, they were talking about at the last meeting, um, cutting rates in 2024. And then subsequent to that, various other Fed governors came out and said, no, 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 uh, we weren't talking about that. And I'll get into that with a slide I have coming up. Look, I just want to state something for the facts. A lot of people are debating soft landing, hard landing, all these things. I believe in the business cycle. If you raise rates like we do, like we have, okay, if you engage in QT, even though I've been messing around with it and we had the, you know, the some of the other things that are going on in the background, in the end, you know, the balance sheet is shrinking over time, okay? If bank credit, which is probably even more important, is tightening for businesses and people, then this is going to eventually lead to a recession. It has in the past, and uh, the, a lot of the indicators that have in the past worked, uh, I believe, are flashing that we're going to have a recession. Now, pinning it down to the exact time, and again, you don't know if you had the recession until after the fact, right? Until all the revisions come in, until everybody looks at it and says, oh, yeah, a year after the recession started, they look back and say, oh, yeah, that's when the recession started. Um, you know, I will grant 
the bulls the space to say that employment has not it's still holding in fairly fairly well even though i think uh, underlying uh factors under there are starting to weaken but regardless uh what you know you have to ask yourself why is the federal reserve chairman talking about well basically they've paused in my view uh we I had a, we had already here at aia thought that that had already happened we we, we you know, a couple months ago, it was obvious that they weren't going to raise rates any longer. But um, they've basically said that. And now they're talking about cuts. Well, why are you talking about cuts if the economy is doing well? You know, and there was various theories. People were writing articles. There's a lot of debate or discussion about this on FinTwit and uh, Zero Hedge. You know, it's because of the political climate. They don't, you know, they want to cut rates and get the economy juice so Biden can get reelected. Uh, they, they see something that no one else sees coming down the pipeline. I mean, it goes back to what I've said before. And I, and I kind of agree with like what Bill Fleckenstein has said for 30 years that I've been listening to him. These people simply don't know what they're doing. They have this huge hammer, they swing it around and, uh, you know, they're always looking in the rear view mirror and they always do things to the extreme. They cut too much and then they, you know, and then they're they're late to raising rates or whatever. And so it's basically comes down to this. It's central planning of one of the most important uh, economic inputs, which are interest rates. OK, they're centrally planning it with a group of people sitting around a table trying to determine what the best rate is for the economy at some particular point in time. And it's no different than Goss plan or Soviet central planning. So therefore, that's why you have all of this consternation and discussion. And everybody has a view on it. But it's an important thing to understand because, again, liquidity drives markets, right? And the liquidity causes changes, can cause changes in sediment. And so liquidity and sediment, in my view, in the short and medium term, as Stan Druckenmiller has said, drives markets. Yes, fundamentals long term drive, drive, you know, can drive things. But in the short and medium term, it's sediment and liquidity. And if we think that liquidity is going to start increasing, well, then uh, that's what people are doing. That's why they bid, bid up things last week. But what they don't understand is history. OK, this is why I think it's so important to listen and follow history and look at probabilities. You know, this Pavlonian response. Oh, they said they're going to cut rates next year. Let me front run this and buy stocks or risk assets. Well, that doesn't really how things work in real time, you know. The lag effect works both with rate rate increases and rate cuts. And so when you already start cutting rates, you're already still feeling the lag effects of the previous rate increases that are working their way through the through the economy. And that takes time. And that's why this chart's important because it shows this is from David Rosenberg's uh, one of his reports it was sent sent out with somebody else's report that I read. Basically, it shows you recessions come after the first rate cut. So this is uh, previous rate uh, Fed pauses and rate inc uh, rate increases. OK, this is the fir first Fed rate cut, and this is the start of the recession. And then the S&P low is after that. So you have a situation where, for example, in the 2006, 2008 recession, 7, 8 recession, great financial crisis, the Fed paused in July of 06. The first Fed rate cut wasn't for like a year later, over a year later. And then the start of the recession was, uh, you know, we were probably already in a recession. That's why they started cutting rates. And then the low for the S&P wasn't, you know, it was almost, almost three years after the Fed paused. And you can go down the list here, right? And, uh, you know, two th May 2000, the tech wreck, same thing. First Fed rate cut was in 2001. This is like almost seven months after the pause. Start of the recession was three months after the first rate, rate cut. And then oh, over a year later is when you had the low in the S&P. And this is just pretty consistent all the way through. And people forget these things or they don't know them. That's the problem. A lot of people just don't know this stuff and they just... No. Now, this isn't guaranteed that this will happen every time, but you have to look at probabilities, okay? It, you know, it doesn't matter what I want to happen or I think should happen. What has happened in the past and is it likely to repeat? That's the question. And so this is what I, this is what I look at. And so, 
you know, if we're acknowledging the pause right this in December, then we could be looking at, you know, a year, two years down the road before, um, you know, we see even, a you know, the recession acknowledged to start six months to a year and then another year after that before the S&P bottoms. And so people, I don't think, take this into consideration. Now, that doesn't mean it's 100% certain it would happen but like this, but I think it, it, what's more likely to happen. So this is a tweet, uh, Peru Saxena. I follow him on uh, Twitter, X, whatever. And uh, I say this right here. I'm like David Rosenberg. I kind of really like listening to him. He's 40 year plus economist on Wall Street that he, you know, he says the same thing. I believe in the business cycle. I don't think the business cycle has been abrogated, okay? And uh, it can change, you know, they might have staved off the recession with all the fiscal spending, but all they did was put us in deeper in debt and pulled demand forward. Doesn't change the ultimate outcome. And so again, uh, just summarizing what we've talked about before, right? The deepest yield curve inversion in 40 years. These are recession indicators that are flashing. Declining leading economic indicators for 19 months year-over-year -year contraction in US M2, which has happened, I think, four, three or four times before, and they've all led to massive recessions. Tightening bank lending standards, okay? So banks are tightening lending. Year-over-year -year contraction in bank credit, year-over-year -year contraction in gross domestic income, not GDP, gross domestic income. Collectively, these have never been wrong. So, you know, again, we don't have 100% certainty that we're going to have a recession, but recessions, and I think we're going to have a hard landing personally, because the excesses of the previous uh, money printing and fiscal spending are going to have to, you know, be worked off. And, I, I, you know, I don't know what is motivating Chairman Powell to say what he says. No one knows. It's speculation. But I do know that... Um, I've said this before, and I've said it, uh, and I'll show other slides about this later on. The world is moving from net tightening to net loosening, okay? Yes, the major central banks, the Fed, the EU central bank, which held rates also steady, uh, Bank of China, Jap Bank of Japan, okay? I'm going to show a chart later on. They're, they, they have been collectively uh, tightening liquidity, but that's changing now. OK, that's reversed and is changing. And the emerging market banks, central banks like the Bank of Brazil and some other other banks, I've already told you that going back three or four months, uh, we've seen a net change from tightening in most central banks to loosening. So it's obvious to me that the liquidity has reversed. Now, again, it will take time and the lag effect uh, to to for that to make its way into the economy, but it will. The change of trend, the inflection is what's important. So this is another tweet. Uh, retail traders are all in again. Dumb money confidence just jumped to the third highest reading in 25 years. It was no problem at all in 2021. Other than that, very high confidence typically precedes modest gains at best until sediment resets. Uh, modest gains at best and uh, big declines and drawdowns at the worst. Um, so just something to keep in mind, you know, you see things like, I, I've shown it before. I, I'm just not that guy. I know there's people listening to this. I know there's people out there that speculate and are very good. I know there's people that rode Carvana up from $4 low up to whatever it's trading at now, 50 bucks a share, 10, a 10 bagger. I mean, I look for undervaluation. I look for businesses that have long-term, I'm old school. Okay. I don't do that. I don't buy stocks that are selling at 10, 20, 30 times sales. Okay. Cause I remember the Scott McNulty uh, letter to shareholders from Sun Microsystems. Okay. These are businesses. If you want to treat it as speculative sar trading sardines, if you're good at that, Allah be with you. I, I wish you well. I hope to see you on the Forbes 400 list. I don't see a lot of traders on that list. What I see is people that had long-term investments in building businesses. They either built them themselves or invested in other people. Okay. That's what creates real wealth and lasting wealth. And again, maybe somebody's out there that is, you know, doing this and is, is killing it. 
And like I said, I, that's not me. I can't do it. I'm not good at trading. So here's a Tavi Costa chart. Um, it shows the S&P 500 index versus job openings. Now you have to be careful with these things because you can pull any set data set and put them together and get them to show a uh, you know correlation. And then you say, okay, well, look, there's the correlation. But something like this that goes back, you know, 25 years, I think is worth looking at. And when you see this extreme of a of a difference, what's going to happen? You know, you have to ask yourself, what is most probable here, that uh, job openings are going to reverse and go up or that the S&P is going to go down? Again, the lag effect, I believe in the lag effect, I believe in the business cycle. As job openings go down in the past, what we've seen, you know, is a move lower in the S&P because that indicates a weaker economy, weaker earnings. I mean, you should be able to figure this out. So this is another uh, outfit that I follow on X. They're pretty good. They put a lot of tweets out, a lot of good stuff. But this shows you the schizophrenia that's at the Fed and why it's so hard uh, to try to figure out what they're doing. But you have to have a view because, again, liquidity and sediment is what drives the markets. You saw what happened when Powell made his speech. And I don't know if he misspoke or if he wasn't on, on side with the rest of the Fed governors, but you saw what the markets did. So it says right here, Fed Fed since November 1st. Well, on November 1st, they said getting inflation to 2% has a long way to go. Well, that's, le that's like 42 days ago, 45 days ago. So getting inflation at 2% has a long way to go. Then on 20 days after that, they said no indication of rate cuts at last meeting. Then on December 1st, they said talks about rate cuts are premature. This is like two weeks ago. December 1st, we were prepared to tighten policy further if needed. December 13th, rates have peaked, three rate cuts coming in 2024. I mean, this is like 12 days difference. And then December 15th, whoops. December 15th, Fed isn't really talking about rate cuts. So you had Powell come out on the 13th and talk about rate cuts. And then these other governors came out two days later and said, whoa, 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 whoa. We're not, we're not really talking about rate cuts. So is this an indication of people that have their act together and know what they're talking about? Is chaos and miscommunication deliberate over there? Or is it what's more likely? You got a bunch of PhDs that... Uh, sitting over there and a lot of people that don't really understand what the what they're looking at or doing because i don't believe they do and uh you know this is what you get they saw what the markets did and so they had to walk it back in again central planning is ridiculous and doesn't work we we laugh at it we point at the soviet union we point at all these other countries that have sent, had central planning and show the results. And yet the biggest, most important um, economic, I don't want to say indicator, but item that affects just about everything, interest rates, is, is centrally planned by a group of PhD economists. Okay. You don't, I, I, I know I'm not the only one that sees the, you know, hypocrisy there or sees the, you know, what's going on. This is another anecdotal uh, data point. Jesse Felder had this on his Twitter feed this week. I thought it was interesting. So our recreational vehicle sales are collapsing. You see what's happening. You see what happened in previous recessions or before recessions, what happens. Um, but I would note that during the 79 to 81, you had two recessions. You had a short one in 79 and then a longer recession. This is when I was like a teenager. RV sales were up a little bit. So again, it's not a hundred percent, but you see, you know, it makes sense, right? In a recession, this is super discretionary spending, right? Big ticket item. Who really needs an RV, right? That you use five times a year. Uh, when you, I don't know why anybody would buy one. You can rent them. But anyways, uh, this kind of a fall off in the past has been, you know, associated with recessions. So again, not taken by itself as 
end all be all, but another another data point. And again, I don't want to get into dueling banjos where somebody says, oh, yeah, but look at this. I'm just saying, I mean, I, uh, you know, this is just pointing it out, just reporting the news. You know, I acknowledge that employment hasn't cracked yet. And, that, you know, but like I said, like I showed on the uh, amount of jobs available, it's it's decreasing. So that's where you see things, you see cracks in the, in, in, in the ice. So this is another chart that uh, kind of shows you, this is when Fed rate cuts. This is S&P performance around start of Fed rate cutting cycles. Um, this is like taken in the, in the back. So this is the median of all episodes. So if you have a soft landing, typically you could have, you know, um, uh, increases. But you see down here, it says median when economy enters recession within 12 months. And well, you know, then you have a, a big drawdown. So you basically put your chips on red or black, right? Uh, what do you think is going to happen? And uh, again, the thing that I caution folks on is this. You have extreme valuation, right? You have a lot of money concentrated in these few stocks at the very top that drive the indexes for the most part. And a lot of this is retirement money. People put their 401k money in. It goes into these uh, basically passive investing. And so if you put $100 in, well, some of it's going to go into Apple, even though Apple's business is not growing that much. It uh, doesn't mean it's a bad company, but you know the valuations are too high. And so when you have these large market cap weighted indexes, the money goes into the largest market caps. And so it perpetuates the, uh, the, the push higher. So I think, you know, as what's going to help reverse the stock market and cause a drawdown in my view, well, if employment actually goes up, let's say employment goes to five, five and a half, six percent. Well, that's money that's not coming in passively anymore. Uh, the market will start to roll over. Uh, people will actually start drawing down people that were maybe get laid off or, you know, sent off for redundancy or whatever job cuts, they may choose if they're older to start retiring, drawing down their uh, assets. They may take a four, they may take a loan against it. They may do all these things that basically short circuit the conduit of money to these passive funds. that has been helped driving these markets higher. And so that's something to keep in mind in my view. So this is, uh, I'll put a link to this article, Callum Thomas, another guy I follow on X, basically commodity CapEx, long period of underinvestment. You can see it right here. Um, I believe that the next, call it a, whatever you want to call it, commodity super cycle, what have you, is not necessarily going to be demand driven like it was in the previous one when China entered the WTO and had that massive expansion in the early aughts. I believe that this next one's going to be from lack of supply. That doesn't mean we run out. That doesn't mean we're going to have, you know, shortages. It means the underinvestment will not allow the supply to keep up with the demand. And that will be sufficient to drive prices higher. Uh, it's economics 101, back to your supply demand curves. When the price goes high enough, that will stimulate the demand. The demand, you know, and this is multi-year, right, uh, efforts. So, that's what I think is going to happen. You see after the last commodity bull market, what happened uh, in the early aughts from China, you saw the investment kind of went nuts, right? Because prices were up. So the investment came in. Um, but right now you see just about everything's negative. Um, and that's, it looks to be reversing just like we have thought. And so I think this continues, right? Because when something overshoots on the downside, it has a tendency to overshoot on the upside, right? Uh, return to the mean. It doesn't just go back to the mean here or, or the average or what have you. It goes above that uh, and then you'll have a period of oversupply, but this takes years to do. And that's what I think is the, is the opportunity. So I wanted to talk about this. You know, we talked about it last week. They were talking about it. So the U.S. House did pass the bill banning uranium imports from Russia. Uh, it's from the article. I'll put a link in the show notes. U.S. House of Representatives on Monday passed a ban on imports of Russian uranium as lawmakers seek to address add pressure on Moscow for its war on Ukraine. 
though the measure has waivers in case of supply concerns for domestic reactors. The House bill contains waivers allowing the import of low enriched uranium from Russia if the U.S. Energy Secretary determines there is no alternative source for operation of a nuclear reactor. Well, there is no alternative source because we don't have an industry here. We let it atrophy over the last you know, three or four decades. And so we've mined very little and convert or enrich very little, if any, if I, I, don't, I, if I recall, I'd have to think about it. We do have that uh, facility in Kentucky. I know people are talking about building new facilities, but this isn't something that's going to get fixed in the next month or two. It's going to take a couple few years of concerted effort. Goes down here, the quote here, the risks of continuing this dependence on Russia for our nuclear fuels are simply too great, said Representative Kathy McMorris Rogers. It's weakening America's nuclear fuel infrastructure, which has declined significantly because of reliance on these cheap fuels. Well, yeah, I mean, if, if, this is this is a national security issue. This was stupid that all these previous administrations, both Democrat and Republican, I've talked about this before, uh, allowed this to happen. You have, you know, if we didn't have any nuclear power plants, that's fine. And if our Navy ran on, you know, fuel oil instead of uh, nuclear for our capital ships, it wouldn't be a problem. But, you know, 20% of the U.S. base load is nuclear and all your carriers and uh, big cruisers and, and nuclear submarine, submarine fleet are nuclear powered. So not smart. But there's two parties to every issue. So this came out on Bloomberg. It said Russia uranium supplier warns U.S. clients to brace for export ban. 10X, a Russian state-owned uranium company, is warning American customers that the Kremlin may preemptively bar exports of its nuclear fuel to the U.S. if lawmakers in Washington pass legislation barring imports of it starting in 2028, according to people familiar with the matter. 10X's U.S. subsidy has warned electric companies, including Constellation Energy, Duke Energy, and Dominion Energy, to prepare for such an outcome, one of the people said, adding that the Kremlin has not made a final decision. Um, goes on to say, such a move risks wrecking havoc in uranium markets, causing prices to spike for the nuclear reactor fuel that may be harder for smaller utilities to absorb. Goes on and on. So it uh, goes down here, adds some more information. It says Russia provided almost a quarter of the enriched uranium fuel used to America's fleet of more than 90 commercial reactors, making it the number one foreign supplier to the U.S. last year. So there you go. Um Without the waivers in the legislation, a 20% increase from the current enrichment price of $152 per separate of work unit to a record high 180 per separate of work unit SWU is possible, according to Jonathan Hines. Then it goes on to say, but if there is an if there is an immediate ban, it could be even more extreme. There are very limited supplies available. So uh, I think they should be careful what they're doing um, and really look at the ramifications. You know, when you, th this whole idea of, you know, I'm not going to get into it. It'll be after the first year when I talk more about what's going on with the war in Ukraine, but I don't think this is really going to affect the Russians one way or another. I think it's a billion dollars worth of uh, fuel a year. And again, they'll just sell it to other people, right, in the global east and west that are growing their reactor fleets. It's not a problem. You can store this stuff. So you don't need to, they're not going to go out of business. It's not going to really affect them longer term. And it, actually, I think they would prefer to sell it to the Chinese and Indians rather than the U.S. I mean, this is kind of like, you know, I'll show you and pull out your pistol and shoot yourself in the foot. It's kind of a Barney Fife mood move, in my view. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't take this seriously and we should be having a space race type mentality towards nuclear power. We should do it. Instead, you hear nothing out of this administration because it's sclerotic and useless like most politicians. OK, they should be having a, a summit on nuclear power on how we're going to take over the nuclear uh, power industry over the next 10 to 20 years in the world. From the fuel cycle to mining, you know. It's like Justin Hune, I was listening to him the other day, there's a billion pounds of uranium in the Arizona basin, right? It's not a shortage of uranium. It's a shortage of political will to set up a national energy priority that is actually sensible and then executing on it. 
from the fuel cycle to mining to the fuel cycle to fabrication to building plants to operating plants safely and correctly that's what we should be focusing on instead you know we're stumble bumming around with this kind of stuff but you know this is the opportunity for us investors and speculators when government gets involved it creates distortions in markets which are uh exploitable by speculators so this is good news i i'm getting we're getting even closer to my prediction coming true i'm finding this very amusing as a matter of fact so the cdu this is the uh the opposition coalition cdu csu and some smaller parties in the german bundestag um obviously the socialists and greens and these folks have power right now in germany but uh, this is uh, this was in a paper. I'll put a link to the um, to the uh, article. It was in Build, which is a very, I guess, big deal publication in Germany. But they're going to unveil their uh, German nuclear plan. I think next week uh, on Monday. I'm not sure. But anyways, this is what basically is. They have like a few demands here. It says demand one: Germany must join the nuclear power alliance with an exclamation point. Not mine. Theirs. Um, that's that deal that came out of COP 2028, 20, where 22 plus countries committed to making nuclear, you know, uh, great again, so to speak. Uh, demand number two, Germany must restart its shutdown nuclear power plants, exclamation point. Quote, a dismantling moratorium must be decided immediately for the remaining nuclear power plants and preparations must be made for restarting them. Specifically, the six power plants that were shut down in 21 and 23 should come back online. Demand three, Germany must build modern, latest generation nuclear power plants. So I don't have enough insight into whether or not this is uh, going to happen uh, for sure, but it's definitely uh, on the radar and it's definitely a issue for the opposition party that's kind of currently out of power. And I think they found a... Um, I think they're going to find an audience for this among the German people. I think people are seeing the handwriting on the wall. Uh, they see the higher costs. They see that the energy vende didn't work, the energy transition, and you know that the current uh, coalition that's in power in Germany uh, is just going to stick with the status quo until you throw them out. It's that simple. You have to throw them out, and then you can reverse it. So I think they're kind of setting the, the cornerstone here for a foundation for a uh, whenever the elections are, I don't even know, but this is, I think, a very uh, big issue: energy security, um, energy uh, policy, and you know their climate change commitments that they do have collectively in Germany and in the EU are going to necessitate nuclear power. I mean, you have several other people part of the um, nuclear power alliance that are European countries that signed onto this, and so Germany is going the other way. Uh, I don't think it's going to happen. I think what's going to happen is there's going to be a change in government there. Uh, this uh, They really mess things up bad there, this current coalition. And I think slowly but surely people are realizing that and that uh, things will reverse themselves, which they tend to do. So uh, this was a uh, slide. Uh, this is from the um, UE, UXC uh, Q3 2023 report. This is on Twitter or X. Can't remember who put it up. But anyways, how high will the price go to coax sufficient investment in a new mine? So here's your demand, right? In green. Here's your production and forecasted production. We're already in deficit. Uh, it's going to get worse over time. And so the price will have to go higher to reverse this big gap i mean if this is what we're gonna do you know this is not that far off right 2030s like you know seven years from now six years from now in 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 two weeks and then you know 2040s only you know seven uh or yeah 17 years so in the scope of mining, that's not that long, actually. So we'll see what happens. But I think it's good to visualize these things to show how great the gap really is. Um, it's just going to have this constant low boil of undersupply that's going to cause problems. And like I said, you have all these commitments now to, re to build out these nuclear fleets. So we'll see. 
I think uh, it just reinforces the reason to stay bullish. Now, now, there's been some people on Twitter, well, the price is up and the stocks really haven't moved. Well, this is what happens, guys. Okay? These stocks don't care what, what you want to happen. This is why I've kind of advocated to shift away from some of these juniors. Um, you know, a lot of them have moved quite a bit from off, you know, from where they were several years ago. And now you really got to, like I said before, go through and figure out who's legit and who's not. Because the share is issuances are going to keep coming. And so, you know, there's nothing wrong with just buying the physical uranium trust and sitting on that, especially when it's at a discount. I wanted to talk about gold. You know, I was thinking about this and talking about it on previous discussions and even in the newsletter. You know, I don't really see anything that's really a fat pitch out there except for gold. What I mean by a fat pitch is something that is very, in my view, overlooked, not really in the forefront of people's minds for speculation and investment. Yes, we're at close to all-time highs in many of the uh, different currencies. Uh, but, you know, and gold is up for the most part in most uh, developed market currencies. I mean, it's amazing. And yet people, you know, the gold stocks are basically haven't really done anything. And I think that's going to change. Uh, I think as uh, the news flow into next year, especially as the liquidity, world liquidity increases, as we see, uh, you know, I think you're going, you saw it the other day for a matter, as a matter of fact, when Powell made his announcement, gold pops pretty decently. So this thing wants to go, it's like a thoroughbred, you know, in the gate, you know, when's the gate going to open and the race start? Uh, I don't know, but I think 2024 uh, is possibly a year when we're going to see, you know, gold well above 2000 to the point where it starts drawing interest. And that's really how this works, right? Um, if something starts moving and it gets the, it gets the publicity, to, you know, it's the shiny object syndrome again. I hate to say it, but that's just how it is. Not just among retail investors, you know, if you sit around and bag on retail investors, institutions are the same way. And so I think that, uh, you know, we've seen central bank buying of over a thousand tons a year for two years in a row. Those are records. Um and I, I just think Western investors haven't come to gold yet. They will, in my view, eventually. Uh, and when that happens and the allocation to gold gets uh, higher than it is, which is almost nil now, uh, you're going to see gold prices go up. And I believe there's going to be a epic bull market in the mining shares. Uh, so uh, I've, I've actually put the first gold stock into the uh, actionable intelligence alert portfolio. I'll be adding more coming up um and but this is kind of again this is kind of a risky game right because you don't know what's going to happen and you're dealing with uh the first stock i put in is an actual producer that's paying about close to a five percent dividend and has upside potential it's a company i've owned off and on over the past uh years it's done very well for me the management team really knows what they're doing and they have a really decent asset uh it's not in a very good country but Again, the record is there. They've done well. Uh, I'll be adding other stocks, um, some juniors uh, that have potential to be taken out or added uh, in a bull market. You know, what typically happens is you need some type of catalyst, something big discovery, some kind of, you know, something to really get these gold stocks, get people's juices flowing. But there's uh, many juniors that I follow that are continuing to drill and add resources, and they have really good, decent projects, and they just need a sediment change, and we could see doubles, triples, you know, quadruples very quickly. So more to come on that. But I think, you know, most people don't pay attention to this, that, you know, gold is up in most major currencies, even the U.S. dollar. So something to take into consideration. So this is the, uh, the, the this is Ronnie Stoifel's, uh thing. I can't pronounce it, but they come out with this monthly gold uh, update PDF. It's about 80 pages. I suggest you can get it for free. Just go to their website here. They have a website and they'll email it to you and you get the annual in gold we trust. It's like 300 slides. But this is what I like to see. You know, you're looking at um, 
this is the blue line is the aggregate bank central bank balance sheets of the Fed, the ECB, Bank of Japan, and People's Bank of China, which are the main central banks. You see this is the trillion in trillions of dollars on the left. You see it's in decline right now. But what I think you need to look at is the um, year over year change. Okay. It basically bottomed in uh, 20 early, late 2022, early 2023, and has gone from less net from negative to less negative. And I think that uh, we are going to see next year, obviously, rate cuts and liquidity injections. Uh, reversing uh, the, the the QT to QE in both the Fed and and, and ECB for sure, um, and so this 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 needs to be watched because again liquidity <laughs> drives uh, uh, drives markets, and so if the major central banks are now going to be in a positive uh, liquidity adding to their uh, balance sheets. Uh, when already a lot of the other central banks around the world are already in front of them doing that, then this is going to become interesting, I think, for um, hard assets. So again, uh, another reason why I think that uh, we're going to see rate cuts instead of and more liquidity. Um, this is the uh, percent proportion of countries meeting the criteria. So uh, deflation, uh, amount of countries with the CPI less than zero. This is climbing now. Okay, it bottomed uh, because of all the inflation. You see, this is uh, this is during the pandemic. Okay, you saw what happened. Uh, amount of countries that were facing deflation went down because everybody was printing money. Uh, now that's reversed and went up, and you see the amount of countries that were facing hyperinflation, which is CPI above ten percent. You see that has crash. That's why all these central banks are cutting rates in these emerging markets, right, in these uh, other than developed countries. And so I think this uh, is uh, positive. I, uh, uh, again, it plays right back into what I have been saying. And I think uh, this is uh, interesting uh, to what uh, this is from top down charts. So uh, I think it's a uh, I think we're on the right track. I thought we I think we caught the inflection. And I've been like easing into emerging markets over the last six months or so. And I think those are going to do well you know, over the next several years, by the way. Here we go. Brazil, you know, we have a Brazilian, we have Brazilian stocks in the portfolio. They've done well. Um, and this one of the reasons why is because of the rate cuts we've seen in Brazil as uh, liquidity now is being uh, created uh, rates are coming down. The inflation rate is inside the Central Bank of Brazil's target range. And so they need to get those real rates down. And they are. And that's having a positive effect on the stock market or our stocks, at least. Uh, here's what they have to say from the article, which I will put in the show notes. Brazil's Central Bank lowered its benchmark interest rate by 50 basis points on Wednesday for the fourth time in a row and signaled that it would keep cutting rates at that pace beyond its next meeting in January. The bank's rate setting committee, known as COPM, unanimously lowered the CELIC policy rate to 11.75% in line with the forecast of all 41 economists polled by Reuters. Quote, headline consumer inflation as expected remains on a path of disinflation and various measures of underlying inflation are closer to the inflation target in recent releases, wrote, wrote policymakers. Still, Copham's statement signaled a steady pace for rate cuts ahead, adding that board members, quote, unanimously anticipate further reductions of the same magnitude in the next meetings. So definitely uh, Brazil isn't the only central bank around the world cutting rates. Again, I track many central banks. Uh, uh, again, the the we have tipped over into more banks cutting rates than raising rates. So we're clearly have entered, in my view, the next liquidity up cycle. And so we'll have to see how this plays out. Um, so far, the stocks that we have in the portfolio have performed fairly decently. And I expect that that will continue uh, when I'm talking about Brazil. And I'll be looking to add other emerging markets. I already have some emerging market stocks in there also. Um, uh, so we'll be looking to add more in, in areas. You know, I'm very bullish on Mexico because of the reshoring. Uh, I'll give an example. I was able to buy... You know, I didn't put it in the portfolio, but I'll just talk about it here. You know, there was a, 
situation a, a few months ago in Mexico where there was some confusion in the markets. This is what you have to look out for. And I got tuned up on this on some people that I follow on Twitter or X. Um, I've always really liked these airport operators in Mexico. There's Mexican airports, major airports are, are the government gives concessions to these private companies that are listed on the stock market to run these airports and they get certain fees. And of course, uh, you know, it's kind of like a utility, right? It's a steady uh, cash flow, but they've always in my mind been a little bit overvalued. Now the time to really buy them was after during, uh, what do you call it? Uh, the pandemic, because obviously air travel crashed, blah, blah. That was really time to buy it. I didn't do it. I should have. Uh, I didn't. But then I was, I've continued to watch them. And there was one operator, uh, they took a hit because there was some, the market kind of misconstrued some changes in uh, the taxing or royalties or something with the government. Uh, it got misconstrued. Uh, basically, they just took back some of the advantages they gave them during the pandemic to help them recover. So they're just like back to their normal operating. And so that really caused those those things to drop considerably. And then one of the operators, which is called uh, North Central, it's basically the symbol was OMAB, Oscar, Mike, Alpha, Bravo, uh, Central Mexico, North Mexico, I can't remember. Anyways, uh, they control a bunch of airports. And then they had the big hurricane that hit Acapulco and knocked out the airport there. But that particular airport was only like two or three percent of the revenue of OMAB. And so that knocked it down even further. So basically it was in a situation where it was like around ninety dollars a share. And I think it got as low as like the low fifties, like fifty-two or fifty-three. And so I bought it, right? Because I bought a I bought a tranche and uh it's not gonna 10 bag, but it's one of those things that you buy and just put in your portfolio. Uh, because it's going to perform over time, right? It's going, and if you get a chance to buy something at a discount like that, because of the market misconstruing uh, what the government told these companies or did with these companies, the market misconstrued how, the effect of what how it would affect their uh, their revenue and earnings, and then more uh, of an effect with uh, the the Acapulco Airport getting knocked out. I mean, it was only out of commission for like three or four days. I mean, there was pictures of like the control tower with all the windows blown out on Twitter. But then I saw that flights were even restarting like within three or four days, not major service, but it, they had cleared the runways and at least were aircraft were coming and going. So that knee jerk selling sometimes the, the lesson here is knee jerk selling. If you have companies that you want to buy, I have a watch list and I put them in my watch list because it might be too expensive. But then if something happens and then I have an opportunity because of a dismark location or some specific thing like happens, then I'm able to buy them on the, you know, and get into it uh, at a discount, then I'll take that opportunity. So that was an, that was an example of how that happened. Now, I didn't put it in the portfolio because we're looking for, you know, th that's like a long-term investment in my 401k stuff like that. I'm not going to, that's not really what the newsletter is set up for. I mean, I will try to mention that stuff uh, publicly going forward, but it's not, you know, the lesson, uh, and, I, and I'll probably show in the newsletter, uh, I'll probably do a review on it just to show um, thinking of how you can, what you should be on the lookout for, right? And how you can take advantage when the market serves up these things to you. It's like free money, right? you see a pile of money in the corner, you just walk over and pick it up. But you had to kind of like already been following these companies. And then when these things happened, you could have curated enough experts that knew what was really going on with that legislation or that change in uh, policy of the government, that it really wasn't what the market thought. And it turned out that the, these guys were right. And then, you know, you throw on the piling on and knocking down the share price of that hurricane for one of their airports i mean they have many airports so it wasn't going to like take the company out and so it was just a knee-jerk reaction it's like okay you need to be in here buying this if you if you like it you know if you if you like the company and with the only reason you didn't buy it because you thought it was overpriced at 90 and now it's selling at 52 you got to be a buyer so anyway that was kind of long-winded i'll get into it in the newsletter as kind of a lesson learned type situation to uh, help make people better investors or maybe even as a free article i don't know so I wanted to talk about the copper supply. You know, again, um, 
things are a lot more precarious on the supply side than people thought. So this is an article from mining.com and a couple snippets from the article. Quote, a forecast of surplus of copper going into 2024 has suddenly all but disappeared. The next couple of years were supposed to be a time of plenty for copper, thanks to a series of big new projects starting up around the world. The expectation across most of the industry was for a comfortable surplus before the market tightens again later this decade, when surging demand for electric vehicles and renewable energy infrastructure is expected to collide with a lack of new mines. In the past two weeks, one of the world's biggest copper mines was ordered to close in the face of fierce public protests. That's the first quantum mine in, in Panama, by the way, while a slew of operational setbacks has forced one of the leading miners to slash its production forecast. That's uh, Anglo-American. And you can read more in the article, but this is exactly what I'm talking about. You're right on the knife's edge with supply demand, and then some two unexpected things happen, in addition with the fact that Cadelco and Chile, Chile their production's lagging, and they're the largest copper producer. I mean, this is what can happen. You go from, okay, we were going to be in surplus, no problem, and now all of a sudden we got a big problem, right? And so uh, this is kind of evidence of what I'm talking about of why I'm bullish on commodities because the underinvestment creating supply uh, or lack thereof uh, issues, which is going to translate, in my view, to higher prices, which are needed to, in fact, stimulate investment to alleviate these supply uh, distortions or, or, or um, supply deficits. Okay, guys, that's it for this week. Appreciate your um, viewership. We're coming up on the holidays, we're coming up on the end of the year. Uh, I'll be trying to make some forecasts in the next year. It's not really going to change. I'll just probably reiterate what I think my base case is. But uh, yeah, I think that... Uh, I think liquidity is going to be increasing next year, more central bank cuts around the world, uh, money supplies increasing. Um, and I think, you know, more money and the same amount or less uh, hard assets means higher prices. So it's not that easy and simple and linear, but that's kind of uh, where we're heading in my view. Okay, guys, that's it for this week. We'll talk to you next week. Thank you.